Gracious God, by the power of your Holy Spirit, quicken our understanding that we may receive the testimony of Scripture and believe in the signs that reveal your presence. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Most of us, we know the story. A wedding in Cana of Galilee is probably one of our favorite as Episcopalians. <laughs> Be honest, water and the wine sounds good to us. <laughs> but the whole crux of this gospel is in that last sentence. And Jesus revealed his glory. That's what this whole nativity or narrative is about this morning. See, in the Gospel of John, he doesn't open with all the nativity narratives and the life of Jesus. He really doesn't even open too much with the focus on his baptism. How does he open? Remember? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and then suddenly, here's John the Baptizer, not John the Gospel writer, just to be clear, John the Baptizer is out at the Jordan, and three times the writer has the Baptizer pointing to Jesus and verifying he's the Messiah, not me. Why does John do this, the writer? of this gospel, because from the opening of his gospel book to the conclusion, we are supposed to understand, fully comprehend, without doubt, Jesus is the Messiah. And in being the Messiah, his whole purpose was to come and to reveal the glory, the grace, the abundant love of the Father. See, John doesn't open like the other synoptics do. They all have John the baptizer proclaiming, Repent! Right? Repent! And turn back to the Lord. This gospel never says that. Instead, they have Jesus coming and being already a revelation of God's love and glory. So let's look at what does this first of the seven signs reveal to us about God and about Jesus, his son, today. Here's the things I think that it reveals. First, Jesus is going to reveal God's grace to us, then God's abundance to us, God's delight in us, God's wonder, and all for the sake, because there is an urgency and a power in the mission of God. I promise some of you are looking at your watches. I'll get it done short this week. <laughs> I know, last week was a little long. First, Jesus reveals the grace of God. First, the seven signs takes place in a normal, everyday, communal event. People get married all the time. They did then, they do today. And it's a community event. Most people don't just, you know, get married. Now, some do, I suppose. But most people have at least some friends there. And in a particular little, little village like Cana, you would have invited all your friends and family. It would have been a large event. Probably not 200 people, but it would have been a large event. It goes on for several days. Jesus and some of his disciples, he doesn't have all 12 yet, but he's got four or five that he's invited. They're with him. They're all there. Mary is there. I don't know why she's in charge. Maybe she made herself in charge. Maybe she's a friend of the family or, you know, a long-lost relative and was put in charge. I, we don't know. But for whatever reason, she's there, and Jesus is there. And Jesus allows for his very first sign to happen in the life of community. Because that's where God's grace happens. It's it within community. And the grace comes within everyday earthly beings and things. Jesus uses water. Now water, in this case, that happened to be put into purification jars, which are empty. He has to have the servants refill them to the brim. Why are they empty? Well, because all the guests have come and washed. That's what you did. you got to get clean, my friends. It's a dusty road out there. They've all washed. They've gotten clean. That's exactly what that water was for. And Jesus says, refill it. And he uses earthly things of water and change it into the sacrament of wine. 
the best wine, not just average table wine. I mean, this is powerful. But God happens in community using what he's already created to bless us every day. That's God's amazing grace. Second, God reveals his abundance. Now, we you know, like I said, there wasn't, there wasn't like 200 people there. They've already been partying for a few days because they're out of the wine. And Jesus now fills up six 20 to 30 gallon jars of wine. <laughs> they're going to have wine when all the friends and family have left, my friends. That's abundance. It is overflowing. And that's how God gives abundantly. We live in a world that's always talked about scarcity. We're always afraid. There's not enough. There's not enough. And Jesus wants us to show that, yes, there is. There's more than enough when we put our trust in God because God knows exactly what we need. And every time he gives, he gives lavishly, abundantly. God, Jesus reveals God's delight. I love this part. Yes, it's you know, in a metaphor here, we're talking about marriage, but it's a community event, remember? It's a communal life <coughs> event. And Jesus is a party goer. That means God is a party goer. We need to hear that and we need to celebrate that today. Because there's also too much talk about how punal our God can be. As if he's always come and he's, and he's just ready to strike us down. And that's an out and out lie. Because if that's how my God worked, my friends, I would have died a long time ago. <laughs> I'm dead serious. I was not a good teenager. <clears throat> we all live. Because sin equals death. But God's mercy is to delight. He created all of us, males, females, his creation. And when he created humanity, what did he say? It is very good. He delights in his creation. There's a reason he allowed his son to be there and for the first miracle to happen in such a beautiful way. Because he delights in us. And he wants us to delight in him. To be filled with joy, even when times are tough. To know that God is with us, to know that we are always in relationship with God, no matter how much we might think our sin might push us away. There is nothing you and I can do under heaven to destroy that, as long as we understand that God's there reaching for us to return. He delights in us. God's wonder. In this story, there are very <coughs> few witnesses to what actually takes place. Think about it. Jesus knows what takes place. Those poor servants who had to keep going back to the well to fill up six jars of 20-gallon things each. Ooh, boy, did they know what took place. And I have a sneaky hunch his disciples probably knew, but they're, maybe they were helping, but they certainly would have been with Jesus, right? But there's very few. Not even Mary really knows what happened. Because she like gave the order and went to do whatever. Very few. And yet, all of them at the wedding get blessed by the miracle. That's God's wonderment. Isn't that amazing? We, in other words, we don't have to be present at the moment of the miracle for the blessing to be received and to trickle out over the community. That's amazing. That God's wonder can just spread like that. It just ooh, fills me up. It gives me goose chills. That's God. And lastly, why is this so important? Because there's an urgency and there's a power at work here. Mary came to her son. Because he's the eldest, probably, to be honest. But he is Jesus. You know, he's come out, he's told everybody, yeah, here's what I'm doing. So she knows, she's aware of his mission and purpose. 
And she has every faith in her son that he will make it happen, whatever it is. And she looks at the servants and tells them what? Do whatever he says. Be ready to respond. That's the urgency. We pray and we pray and we pray. And then we pray some more. And sometimes we begin to think, are you listening, God? Are you acting? What are you doing? What's going on? And it's because we live in a human moment that we think is eternal, but it isn't. We feel like it, but it isn't. But God, I promise, is acting. God is moving. We just can't always see exactly what's happening. But we have to continue to be a people of faith and in prayer. And when God says, be ready, fill it up. Share it with someone else. Take it to the community. We have to be ready to act and respond in those ways. There's an urgency and there's a mighty power in it. God doesn't act alone. He expects his creation to act with him. That's the message of the gospel this morning. How will we respond? That's our reflection for this epiphany season. Will we be ready? Will we go? Will we take it to others? Will we share the abundant, gracious wonderment and miraculous love of God? Let us pray. Holy God, through your signs of grace, you reveal your glory to all the world. Open our eyes to the hidden and surprising wonders you perform, that we may believe with our minds and trust in our hearts that you alone are Lord of all creation. Through Christ, in the power of the Holy Spirit, you are one God. We pray. Amen. Amen.